Okay, always start with OK. Have you ever noticed that? Yeah. So in this video, what we're going to be looking at is the history of acid dot points to do with the HSC chemistry syllabus. And um, it's just a very brief um, description of how our theories of acids and bases has changed throughout time based on experimentation. Like any um, science theories, if the theory does not explain experimental evidence, then we need to sort of look at the theory and maybe modify that theory based on new information. So we're going to be looking at these particular theories here. Let's check out the first person we're going to be looking at is Robert Boyle. Back in 1661, a lot of his basic ideas of acids and bases came from experimentation. Then we have Antonio Lavoisier in 1766. Then we had Humphrey Davy in 1810. Svante Arrhenius in 1884 and Bronsted Lowry um, chemists uh, most recently in 1923. So you're not expected to know these dates. However, it, you can see a gradual progression in the theories and our understanding of what's going on. So let's check out the next one. Robert Boyle, um, he put our basic definitions of acid and bases together from experimental observations. And this is what he found. Okay, um, this is ones we normally teach juniors. And so we say acids are tasting sour. They turn cabbage juice red, they're corrosive, um, and they neutralize bases. And so those features there are features that are characteristic of acids. Bases, on the other hand, taste bitter, turn cabbage juice like a blue, and they feel slippery. And we know a lot of these characteristics from everyday experience. So you wash your hands with soap, and the soap feels slippery, so therefore it must be a base. Uh, you bite into an orange, and it tastes sour, so therefore that must be acidic. Okay, so they're the basic definitions from Robert Boyle. All right, and let me have some pictures there just to illustrate. Antonio Lavoisier um, was the next scientist, and I put a big capital O there to give you a bit of a hint there about where he's going with his beliefs. But he's considered about the father of chemistry because he was the first to discover the role of oxygen and named hydrogen. All right, so he devised the chemical naming system. Um, which was very important because it was very confusing back then when they were talking about chemicals. So instead of just using the name of elements, they would use other names like deflagisticated air. Now, what did he believe? He said that acids were substances that contained oxygen because he noted that when he got metal oxides and mixed them with water, they produced um, acidic solutions. And of course, we know from previous examples that we have um, non-metal oxides here, so phosphate is going to produce phosphoric acid and sulfur is going to produce sulfurous or sulfuric acid. So he said, well, since those um, metal oxides contain oxygen, it must be the oxygen, the properties of the oxygen that, that result in the acidic properties of acids. However, there was a problem because many acids did not have an oxygen in it. For example, HCl doesn't have an oxygen in it, however, it's an acid. Ammonium iron does not have an oxygen in it, however, it's an acid. And to complicate things more, some bases had oxygen in them, but they were not acidic. So sodium hydroxide, magnesium hydroxide. So the fundamental basic theory that he put forward that acids are substances that contain oxygen starting to break down from experimental observation, and so therefore we had to modify our theory. All right, where to next? Well, um, we have to go to Humphrey Davy. Now, notice I put a capital H in his name because, surprise, surprise, he said acids were those that contain hydrogen. Okay, so he showed that many acids do not contain oxygen. He studied hydrochloric acid, and back then it was called oxymuriatic acid, right, and showed that it did not contain oxygen but still had acidic properties. So he said now we've got evidence to show that acids do not have oxygen and we need to update our theory. And so he said acids contain hydrogen. However, there's a problem with that one. See, this hydrogen theory for acid works well for hydrochloric, sulfuric, but there are many substances that contain hydrogen and had no acidic properties. Right, so example, water had hydrogen, didn't have an acidic property. And it even and we have substances like ammonia has hydrogen, but it's not an acid, it's a base. So these 
large generalizations about whether it contains oxygen or hydrogen started to break down and we needed to be more specific in our definitions. So along came Svante Arrhenius. Okay. And he said that an acid is any substance which delivers hydrogen ions to the solution. And so here's some equations that probably look familiar to you. Hydrochloric gas ionizes to produce hydrogen ions and chloride ions. But when you put them into a um, liquid, and that's why we've got the aqueous there, it's like you bubble it through a liquid water, and we have an acid. If we have nitric acid, that dissociates, produces hydrogen ions, therefore it's an acid. And then sulfuric acid, hydrogen ions. So Svante Irinius said that we have electrolytes, that is substances that break apart and um, can conduct electricity, but he said they had to exist as ions, and it was the, those ions in solution that gave rise to our acid and basic properties. Right? So the key point here is that for Arrhenius acid and Arrhenius base, they need to ionize to produce H plus for acids and OH minus for, ion, for bases, but they have to be in solution. Okay? In solution. So, let's see if there's a problem with this one. Well, the solvent has no role to play. That is, we place hydrochloric acid and benzene, right, a different, sulf different um, solvent than water. No dissociation occurs, and it has no acidic qualities. So there's a problem there. So the Arrhenius definition works with a water solvent, but it doesn't work with a non-water solvent, or in this case, a non-polar benzene solvent. Not all bases contain OH, right? So Arrhenius did say that they had OH and that these dissociate in solution or ionize in solution to produce OH minus ions. However, ammonia does not have an OH minus ion. So now we get to the Bronsted-Lowry theory. And this theory allows us to explain those other previous problems. So they say that an acid is a proton donor. It supplies a hydrogen ion. And a base is a proton acceptor. In other words, the solvent is important. The solvent plays a role. Here's some examples. If we have hydrochloric acid, the acid being HA, it donates the H plus to the base. Okay, And in doing that, you can see that we form a chloride ion over here. The water accepts the H plus from the acid and forms a hydronium ion. Okay, so we have an acid donating it, the height the H plus, and then we have a base accepting it. So that's the Lowry-Bronsted theory. So using this Bronsted-Lowry theory introduces the concept of conjugates. So we can see here that we have an acid HA, it donates a H plus to the base. In doing so, it leaves behind the, the minus ion here, so it's called the conjugate base. Let's go to the next slide and see if we can make a bit more sense of that. Okay, So here we have acetic acid. Acetic acid will donate a H plus to the water. In doing so, it will form the ethanoate ion. Okay, So this is known as a conjugate pair. The acid here and the base there. So this is the conjugate Acid, this is the acid which forms its conjugate base. Then we have the water. The water picks up the hydrogen ion, so therefore it's a base to form its conjugate acid. Okay, so we have these, this new term now, this conjugate acid base pair. And depending upon which way you're going with the equilibrium, the terminology may change. So if we're going from left to right, then you could say that the left is the acid and the right is the conjugate base. Okay, if you're going from right to left, then you might say um, this is the base to produce the conjugate acid. Right? But we've got these generalizations down here. The stronger the acid, the weaker the conjugate base. So here we can see it's an equilibrium sign. This is we've got a weak acid here, so we can go backwards and forwards. However, if I had a very strong acid there, such as HCl, it's going to go towards completion. So it's going to form a conjugate base, but that is so weak 
it's not going to accept the proton from water and form the acid again. So the equilibrium lies right towards the right, pretty much 100% dissociated, right? Or ionized. So the stronger the acid, the weaker the conjugate base. And this concept is going to get very, very important when we talk about pH of salts that you have to understand. So um, if you have, let's say, um, a salt of sodium chloride, then that's going to dissociate to sodium ions and chloride ions. And they're both, um, you know, very, very, very weak conjugate acids and bases. And so they're not going to react with water. So we'll delve into that concept a little bit more because um, that means it's pH 7 then, right, sodium chloride. We'll delve into that concept more when we talk about acid base, um, sorry, the pH of the salts. So that is browry Lonsted with conjugate acid base pairs. And we're going to make an, I'll make another video specifically on that so you can help identify those and maybe even some exam questions as well. So if we were to rank our acids, which we, which we see, we can see the strong acids up here, HCl, it dissociates. What's the strength of the chloride ion? Well, negligible. In other words, it's so weak, it's not even worth talking about. So why are we talking about it? Well, because of the picture. As we go down, the strength of the acid starts to decrease. And so we have sulfuric acid, nitric acid, hydronium ion. But then we get to medium acids. You can see here we've got acetic acid, which is very weak. And uh, it gets a fairly weak ethanoate or conjugate base. When we go down a little bit further, um, you can see the weaker the acid, the stronger the base, the conjugate base. So I hope that makes sense in terms of the, the theory. Of acids and bases you can see we start off very generalistic and as one theory changes into another we start to improve our understanding and explanation of observations however they weren't fitting exactly a hundred percent of the time and so a new theory had to be put forward and the one here the last one we ended on browry Lonsted, we can explain the action of the solvent to help explain how salts and that have a pH based on this idea of conjugate acid-base pairs. All right, hope that makes sense. I'll see you in the next video and check out the ones, the exam questions on this and the video specifically to conjugate acid-base and pH of salt.